This is Twit. Not yet a law in the EU, but boy, I think Apple and Google both lobbied hard against this. Uh, a law that would force Apple and I guess Google and anybody who has a store, uh, you have to be uh, a company with more than uh, 75 billion euros value, annual sales of seven and a half billion and 45 million monthly users. I think Google and Apple both qualify. Uh, then you have to offer third-party payment options in your steady your stores this is something epic sued apple over and lost although the, that's on appeal right now uh saying we don't want to pay 30 percent to apple um you will you could and i think even more important to me i don't i'm not i don't care so much about that that's something maybe developers uh, who don't want to give apple 30 percent companies like netflix and amazon and uh, and epic uh might not like but i think the thing that is more important to me and actually i think would be a big improvement interoperability with Apple's messages. Uh, it, Apple would have to open up, I'm going to quoting here, and interoperate with smaller messaging platforms if they so request. Users of smaller big platforms would then be able to exchange messages, send files, or make video calls across messaging apps, giving them more choice. This, it, uh, I think, is really the crown jewels for Apple. In fact, we saw in the Epic versus Apple discovery emails from Apple CEO uh, Tim Cook, Scott Forstall, Eddie Q, and others saying, we don't make messages on Android. That's the only reason parents are buying Apple phones for their kids, so they can be green bubbles. Apple would also have to allow users to uninstall Safari and other stock apps, and this would be a good one, too. Replace them with third-party alternatives if they so wish. Although iPhones lately have allowed you to use a third-party browser instead of the default Safari. Well, hold, hold it's on. Still WebKit, hold on, though. Leo. Oh. Yes. When you use any third-party uh, web browser on Apple devices, you're, you're, you may be using their sort of shell of a browser, but the actual thing doing the rendering, uh, the accessing the web pages, is still WebKit. This is a perfect example of... I'll, I'll take this position... Why government <laughs> maybe shouldn't weigh in on these technical issues. I think the EU legislators say, well, you just make them uninstall Safari. Make that a, an option. Don't understand. That's not a solution. Right. <laughs> You'd have to say, oh, you can use some other rendering engine. Chromium or whatever. Yeah. 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 Right. Which which I would which now there may be some downsides or maybe Apple doing some you know power efficiency style stuff with WebKit that makes a you know better experience on an iOS device regardless of which browser you know you, you're using with it fine but I don't know I really my personal belief is that if I do if I put Chrome on an iPhone it should be Chrome right I it agree and in the case be, of iPhone yeah. it's not it's WebKit with a Chrome Chrome yes. on top right right. Yeah. right. Um, gatekeepers, again, Apple, Google companies, I guess Facebook would qualify. Although Facebook, if Facebook's value keeps going down, <laughs> pretty soon they'll be low enough. They don't have to worry about this. Uh, we'll have to make it as easy to unsubscribe from services as subscribe. Yeah. Uh, for the most important software, for instance, web browsers not require this software by default upon installation of the operating system. Ensure interoperability of messaging services, basic functionalities. I think that would be... Doesn't mean that Apple would have to make messages for Android, however. It just means... I mean, I think, I think they, this one might no, be... No, but if, if Google well, wanted no, to I, make their messaging app work with Apple messages, then right. they would have to allow that. Oh. Yeah. Apple or, or, any or, or any third or party. Any, Anybody yeah, could make any, an Android yeah. app. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Allow so app it's, developers. It's not, going to require, it's not going to require Apple to make an Android messages app, but anybody else could do it and and tie into it. Right. Tie into their platform. Right. right. So I they like just have that. To provide the APIs. I like that. Right now, you have to jump through hoops uh, to get wow. Apple messages on an Android device. I like it right up until the point where I start getting spammed by the random person that has an app <laughs> that has access to their network. Oh, good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I'll, I'll channel Alex Lindsay on MacBreak Weekly because he's dead set against any of these changes. You know, uh, I th and I think he has a point that the way Apple does it, admittedly, to Apple's benefit, uh, it's lock-in, it's proprietary, it's a silo. But the way they do it also makes it easier and cleaner for users. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's a good point. 
um, is it, that's a that's a good point, you know. But more secure. Too. I think users should have the right to if they want to make their life messy. They should be able to do it. You should have the right, right. to be less secure. You should, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you shouldn't be locked into a particular means of doing something. If if you if you want to take that risk, you should you should be allowed to do that. There's not there's yeah, nothing and, stopping people from using things like WhatsApp and Telegram, though. I think I think yeah. that's the big problem with all I have with all of this is that they're not going to go stop these these they're not not going to make them be interoperable. Which means then people are just going to move to those. I, I just don't understand this this line of thinking, unfortunately. Well, the the the, pro the the problem with that, you know, and particularly for messaging apps, probably more so than anything else, is you know you really are that. I mean, that is probably the one place where the network effect is the the biggest factor. You know, you can sure you can switch from Apple Messages to WhatsApp or or um, you know anything or anything else or Signal or whatever you want. But if you can't get all the people you communicate with to come over as well, right. then it's right. useless to you. So it's, it's, you, know, yeah. you should ha you should have the ability to go from WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram to Apple Messages or to WhatsApp or to you know to, to go back and forth between any of these from any of these. It should be a many to many relationship, not a one to one relationship. Yeah, it's it's shocking how high a percentage of folks will just use the default thing. Whatever right. the tyranny right. of the what default. came on the phone. Yep. Yes. Yep. Right. And, and they, you know, many people in that group don't even realize that they can install extra apps. They're like, oh, I could, I could put WhatsApp <laughs> on there. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they don't understand the difference between the green and the blue on iMessage, right? <laughs> they just that, know they don't too. want those right. bluebies yeah. in there. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it, but you know what? It is a strong lock-in. I, you know, I've mentioned this story before. My son, I asked my son who was in a fraternity at CU Boulder a couple of years ago. I said, uh, how many kids have Android? How many iPhone? He says, there's only one kid with Android. And and he's the blue bubble. He, we, he's left out of all of our group conversations. Uh, there's huge pressure as a result to be an iPhone user. Apple knows that. And also, uh, to some degree, uh, like, I kind of want there to be more interoperability just to try to reduce, not that I want everybody to end up settling on iMessage necessarily, but I mean, remember way back in the day when you had to use like ICQ? Trillium. Or not yeah. ICQ, Trillium for ICQ Pigeon. and like MSN yep. and oh, our Pigeon, right? For, where ADM you had to use, on the Mac. Well, yep. Yeah, and I still remember my stupid ICQ number even right now. I don't yeah. know why. Um, That's crazy. What's your yeah, ICQ exactly. number? Go ahead, tell me. One six nine six six eight two. You guys remember and your ICQ numbers? It, see, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter if somebody no. spams me because I haven't logged into that <laughs> in like ten years. <laughs> you probably you still have an account, Lou. Do you remember your ICQ number? I do one four four one one four. Oh my god! Do you remember see, yours, that's a, Sam? That's a nice one. Actually. I yeah. I never used ICQ, <laughs> uh, and I wish I could remember my CompuServe number. I know I my CompuServe it. number. I'm sure I remember. I'm sure I had an ICQ number, but I don't remember. CompuServe seven five one zero six comma three one three five. Yeah, but we but we used to use those apps that would tie all those together because there were so many dang different oh, ones. Oh, it was so and it annoying. Was such a pain in the butt, right? Yep, yep. And you know, and nowadays it's sort of the same thing, right? I have family overseas to talk to them. Oh, I gotta use WhatsApp or I gotta use whatever the other thing that they use over there. You have to have all the them. apps, basically. Yeah. Because right. this guy mm -hmm. uses Messenger, this guy uses WhatsApp, he uses Telegram. I wish I could use Signal Don't for everything. Uh, right. if, if Signal didn't tie to a phone number. I would use Signal for everything, and I would just say, you know, everybody has to signal me, but you can't because you has one per phone. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, and there's always going to be somebody that's not using that. And then they use another thing. <laughs> and right. yeah, I mean, this is this is the beauty of email. This is why email worked so well because it didn't matter what what system. I mean, at least that's once right. we got past MCI mail, you could use whatever mail app you wanted, and it still went through. So how come we were able to solve it with email, but we can't? We went in the exact opposite direction with messaging. What happened? Standards. It's a protocol. Standards. I mean, email is a protocol. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's lack you, of standards. When you develop a protocol, it's more agnostic versus these specific platforms that are tied down and 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 it was because it so. used to be if you had the source, you couldn't talk to people on CompuServe, and if you had MCI Mail or Genie, they, these were all they were not interoperable. These were like the, like it is today. They were siloed. Right. The difference was you had to have a paid account with those. So if I were, and I had an MCI mail account, I bet I could remember my MCI mail number. But you couldn't email me from any of the other services. So if you didn't have MCI mail, you literally could not email me. That was a bad situation. And the internet 
mail solved all that. And eventually everybody kind of conceded. Today you've got companies that say, no, 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 this is, this is my business model. I'm not going to let iMessage interoperate with anything else or Facebook mm -hmm. Messenger. So I, I, in that respect, I think the EU is not wrong. Uh, it would be nice. I don't know if you can have a legislative solution. By the way, well, if I think I think the key to a legislative solution is it needs to be technology agnostic. The legisl the regulations can't specify that you have to do it a particular way. They just have to you have to specify what is the end result that you want. You right. want any messaging system to be able to talk to any other messaging system. That's it needs to be results oriented, not specifying a particular technology solution. And if you do that, then... Well, they're not saying you have out. to use XMPP. They're not no. going that far. They're just saying it has to be interoperable. Yeah. They're kind of targeting them. They're kind of targeting the big ways, right? They're saying that you have to make a certain amount before we start targeting. Oh, yeah. Right? So they're, Absolutely. So they're, they're yeah. kind of targeting those specific Well, it's kind of a, a form of antitrust. And the EU's right. view of antitrust is very different than our view of antitrust. Uh, in the United States, but although I have to say it's going in this direction as well in the U.S. Uh, by the way, this is not a light fine. It, again, this is provisional. My, I, as I remember, it's a complicated system, but every country has to ratify it before it's the rule of that country. If the gatekeeper violates the rules laid down in the legislation, the EU says the fine can be up to 10% of its worldwide revenue. Billions. This is not that slap on the wrist 5 million euros that the Irish state authorities <laughs> charging Apple every week for a repeat offense up to 20% of worldwide revenue. Um, yikes. So um, I guess the overarching question for the three of you is, is this, uh, should legislative bodies do this kind of thing or not? Is this is are they the right people to to do this, Lou? I don't think so. I know I'm probably the the odd man out here. I just I just think that I mean, maybe it's the way they're going about it is just wrong for me. I think that they they're doing it. They're being they're targeting specific large companies and technology that they make in order to do this. When in fact, I kind of think that's almost anti-competitive. So I don't know. I, that's I'm just my my personal opinion there. What do you think, Alan? I see. I see both sides of it, like you know. I know it's I hard for me to Lou, say one or the other. Yeah. I get where Lou's coming from, but I also feel like okay, if they don't do it, who will and right. how will they? Right, like it has to be somebody right. big enough to actually have an impact if it's ever going to happen. Not necessarily that I support how they're doing well, or how they're going about so it. So that begs the right? second question: Does this need to happen? Is this something we need, or can we just go on the way it is? Again, right. there's That's two sides, question, right? Though. Like, yeah, it's it, there are definitely pros and cons to doing the it, only, right? Like, the yeah. only mechanism we as a society have for this kind of thing, you can't, is is government. That's the whole, that's in theory, maybe not in practice, but the theory is that's society's voice saying, no, no, companies, big tech companies, I know you're there to make a mon make profit. That's your, that's your mantra. That's what you're doing. But we as a society want you to do something that maybe isn't your best business interests, which is make your messaging programs interoperable. And we as a society say, if you want to operate in our society, you need to adhere to that rule. In theory, that's the way to do it, and that's the right way to do it. I think, I think the big issue that comes about from, like, take this example right now, and there's even some other examples that the EU also has done, right? The EU is pretty, you know, aggressive about doing this sort of thing where they want to step in about some particular technological thing. My sort of beef with it is the same thing that's making all of us collectively roll our eyes about the WebKit thing, for example, right? It's like, well, these guys didn't know the whole story, like technologically, right? They didn't have their, their minds fully wrapped around the issue at hand and how to address it and all of the little caveats that the, you know, might come along with it. So, of course, once they make the decision and the requirement comes down, it seems boneheaded to those who actually understand. It's like, well, you guys didn't make a, an informed decision right like they made there was some decision like a year ago or something with respect to uh i think it affected tesla the most but it was it was targeted at like if a car has like a some autonomous type feature then it can't like turn at this exceeding this number of g-force right <laughs> that sounds like and, a good law <laughs> well no no but it, but it was such a low number 
that it was like you basically had to make a Slow turn like down. a grandma. Yeah. Right. So it was like you, you grandma, couldn't even make a turn, turn like a normal. <laughs> r- right. And and it was like and it was to the po- to the point drive. where yeah, and it was to the point where if if you as a regular person tried to adhere to this restriction just driving normally, you would have piles up beh- pile ups right. behind you. Right, because you're just that's it's to but the that's point where all, it's hazardous. That's just that right? they chose a wrong number. Yes, but again, it, it's the whole like you you didn't fully think this out, right? right? Did nobody sit well, somebody in a car time. and yeah, it's like but, you but, know sit somebody in a car and do this much of a turn of, and see in the right? defense of government? That's part of the process. Is you propose a law, somebody points out that's driving like a grandma. You say, all right, what if we make it three Gs? You, it's it's not a done. This is it done and final. There's a process and it can evolve. The Constitution has many amendments. I'm, uh, I don't think that that's a strike against it that they chose a bad number. Well, in a lot of these cases, by the time the number, by the time the information gets out, like it's already sort of a done deal. And then yeah. it's you have to have it's this then, insurmountable. Then the car know, manufacturers have to implement it, whether or not you're going to change it down the road. Right, and then yeah. and then everybody has to complain about it for weeks or months to finally they meet them back in the middle. They should have met them back in the middle before everything was set in stone. On the other hand, I don't think Tesla should be able to roll through stops. <laughs> yeah. right, right, I Sam. agree with you. I yeah. agree with and, you there. You know, to, to, to defend, you know, to defend the regulators a little bit, you know, the the regulatory process is not something that happens quickly. Um, you know, which is both good and bad. You know, it, it's a process that often takes years. Um, you know, and the, I'm not quite sure exactly which one you're referencing there, Alan. Uh, but you know, generally, you know, they'll put out. And this this not this isn't just for auto, you know for vehicles you know it's for everything every regulatory Anything, process, yeah. uh, process they put out a notice of proposed rulemaking you know here's what we're thinking about you know you got 90 days six months to give us comments um, we'll evaluate that and even before they get to that point they've usually done years of research and analysis before they even do that NPRM and then you know then there's the the next stage they go they iterate through that you know sometimes several times before they finally come up with a final regulation yeah of yeah, course and in that case uh, uh, in that case the fault really lies on the other parties for not paying attention 